بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه الغر الميمين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع لي من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عليكم بسنة وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهدين من بعدي أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Respected brothers and sisters in Islam Today is the final episode in our series of discussing the lives and the histories of four Khulafa al-Rashidin The Prophet Sallallahu he stated in, authentic, in an authentic report that follow my sunnah, my way my path and the path and the sunnah of my rightly guided khulafa, my rightly guided successors. Who are these rightly guided successors? The Prophet defined them chrono- chronologically. The Prophet said they will govern after me for 30 years. They will govern after me for 30 years. So who are these people who govern after the Prophet for 30 years? We have Abu Bakr radiallahu an. We have Umar, we have Uthman and the fourth one was Ali bin Abi Talib and after the death of Ali bin Abi Talib 30 years were complete okay radiyallahu anhum ajma'in we love them all we cherish their legacies and we learn from the legacies we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite them in al firdaus al ala they were great people they are our role models every single one of them because the prophet sallallahu alaihi confirmed their value for islam in many, many reports, the Prophet ﷺ, he promised Jannah to all four of them, one after another. We have discussed this issue in the previous episodes that there were categories amongst, amongst uh, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and these categories uh, are as follows. So the first top most important companions of the Prophet ﷺ were in status, uh, the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Al Khulafa al Rashidin, the rightly guided successors who ruled for 30 years. Then the 10, the 10 who were promised paradise by the Prophet ﷺ directly. Then we have Ashab al Badr, about 313 companions of the Prophet ﷺ who fought in the Battle of Badr when it was absolutely suicidal to take part in a, in, in a battle like that when Muslims are outnumbered by far. Uh, as far as the Qureshis were concerned. Then we have uh, people who gave the pledge of allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ under the tree. They are called Ashabu Shajar. And Allah talks about them in the Quran in Surah Al Fatih. And Allah says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Laqad radiyallahu anil mu'mineen, idh yuba'iyuna ka tahta shajar. Okay, Allah is pleased with those who gave you pledge of allegiance under the tree. So these are the categories of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The topmost category is al khulafa al rashidin the rightly guided successors of the Prophet. And we have discussed the history of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. We have discussed the history of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. We have discussed the legacy and the history of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu an. And we have discussed them briefly. That's the point. You must note we have discussed them briefly. And for details, I have recommended books very, very good books, authentic books for you to consult, inshallah ta'ala. And you can go for details to those books. And I will do the same today for the final biography in this series discussing the lives of the four rightly guided caliphs. And today we are going to discuss the fourth rightly guided Khalifa, Caliph, the successor of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his name was. Ali bin Abi Talib, who was also a cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And to begin the whole lecture or the talk about Ali bin Abi Talib, I would like to begin with one particular quote, which is from Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. Who is Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal? Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal is effectively, to put it in short terms, the teacher of Almost every single one of the uh, the hadith narrator uh, from the Sahasitta, he was 
directly or indirectly the inspiration behind the Sahasita, the six collections of hadith, the six authentic collections of hadith, including Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawud Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, and Nasai. So Imam Ahmad was either directly or indirectly an inspiration for the Ashab al-Sunan, right? People who collected the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam authentically, right? So Imam Ahmad's importance in Islam is paramount. His collection of hadith called Al-Musnad, okay? Al-Musnad of Ahmad, Imam Ahmad is the largest single collection of hadith which consists of 28,000 reports. He said about Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, that, and this is narrated by Imam Al-Hakim. Imam Al-Hakim, he narrated from Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, who said, Ma warada li ahadin min ashabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa min al-fadail. Ma warada li Ali radiallahu an, Allahu Akbar. That, the fadail, the virtues that have been transmitted about Ali bin Abi Talib. I repeat, the fadail, the virtues that have been transmitted about Ali bin Abi Talib, those fadail or like those fadail have not been transmitted about any other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I repeat, the fadail, the virtues of Ali bin Abi Talib that have been transmitted within the Islamic sources and the Islamic literature. No other companion of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, fadail about him or virtues about him were transmitted like that. SubhanAllah. So Imam Ahmad is saying that Ali bin Abi Talib, you know, his fadail, SubhanAllah, what has, has been transmitted are far more, okay, in details, okay, in magnitude, than other companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Ali bin Abi Talib, in other words, has huge fadail, huge, huge virtue. And this has been transmitted uh, on the authority of Imam Al-Hakim, uh, and I'm assuming in his Al-Mustadrak. So I repeat, مَا وَرَضَ لِأَحَدٍ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الرَّسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مِنَ الْفَضَائِلِ مَا وَرَضَ لِعَلِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ Okay, so Imam Ahmad was of the opinion that Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an was one of the most virtuous companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is that the case? Of course, we can go on and I can deliver 10 lectures on this topic. You know, there are so many authentic reports describing the virtues of Ali bin Abi Talib that we do, we do not need to forge any fake ones. Okay, there are people out there who proclaim or who claim the love of Ali bin Abi Talib. They claim to love Ali bin Abi Talib. And how do they claim the love? Or how do they actually love him? Practically speaking, they forge erroneous, ajeeb, strange reports about Ali bin Abi Talib. Almost supernatural stuff, okay? Or unbelievable stuff, incredible stuff. The question is, do we need fake, forged, okay, reports about uh, Ali bin Abi Talib? Do we need any fake information on this man? We don't. The authentic information is so much. Our books, are, our books are full of so many authentic reports when it comes to the virtues of Ali bin Abi Talib that we simply do not need to fake or forge reports in his favor, radiallahu an, or to inflate his status beyond what Allah and, his, uh, and Allah and his messenger have described. We do not need these virtues forged so that we can tell people that Ali bin Abi Talib was special. We have so much information that we don't need to fake any extraordinary information about Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh. So these points are very, very important for us to note. So who is Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh? Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh is Ali bin Abi Talib, okay, bin Abdul Muttalib, bin Hashim, bin Abd Manaf, okay, bin Khusay, bin uh, Kilab bin Murrah bin Ka'ab bin Lui bin Ghalib bin Fahr bin Malik bin Nadr bin Kinana. Okay, in other words, Ali bin Abi Talib was a direct cousin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Ali was a cousin of the Messenger of Allah. Ali was the son of Abu Talib 
Abu Talib was the blood brother of Abdullah, the father of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Talib and Abdullah, okay, both of them were blood brother. When I say blood brother, I mean the father was the same and the mother's, uh, the mother was the same. Abdul Muttalib, the father uh, of Abu Talib and Abdullah had married other women and he had other children with those other women. But the special relationship which Abu Talib and Abdullah had was that the mother of both these individuals was the same woman. Okay, that's the point. So the father of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah, and the uncle, Abu Talib, were blood brothers. They were blood brothers. So this is how Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu an, was very closely related to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is something very, very important we have to clarify in the beginning. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of those who was promised Jannah by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was also a brother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through uh, Muakhat. Muakhat was an incident that took place in Medina when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appointed uh, a man from the people of Medina to be a brother uh, with a person who had migrated from Mecca. So the companions of the Prophet who had migrated from Mecca, who had left behind everything, you know, they came completely destitute to Mecca, sorry, to Medina. They migrated to Medina. So in Medina, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made brotherhood between a person from Medina and a person from Mecca so that the person from Medina can help his brother who had migrated in that state from Mecca. So Ali bin Abi Talib, and his, it was his turn, uh, there was no one left. So Ali said, Ya Rasulullah, you did not appoint a brother for me from Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ made a very, very historic statement. He said that, Oh Ali, you are my brother in the dunya and akhirah. To quote the words exactly, Anta akhi fi dunya wal akhirah. Oh Ali, you are my brother in this world and in the hereafter. Allahu Akbar. What an honor. What an honor for Ali bin Abi Talib. Ali is the same person who was married to the daughter, the most beloved daughter uh, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fatima radiallahu anha. All of these virtues I'm describing, they make Ali bin Abi Talib an extremely special person in Islam. Okay, he is one of the topmost personalities in Islam for us to love, for us to cherish, for us to follow. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an. Okay. He was also married to the most beloved person to the Prophet Sallallahu alive. Okay, within the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha, she was asked, who did the Prophet love the most? Who did the Prophet love the most? And the questioner was obviously expecting an answer, me, Aisha. Because the love of the Prophet for Aisha was well known. But to the shock of the questioner. Aisha radiallahu anha responded, Fatima. Fatima was the most beloved individual in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiallahu anha. And Sayyida, uh, Sayyida Nisa al-Jannah, she was uh, the leader of the women of uh, Jannah. And not only the women of Jannah, Nisa al-Alameen, the women of the world. She was one of the most important women to walk the planet. She was one of the four people, four women uh, in, in the history of Islam who were, who were most important. Who were they? The woman of Fir'aun, the wife of Fir'aun, Asia. Her name is, you know, mentioned as Asia in the Islamic sources. Then Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Isa ibn, uh, Isa ibn Maryam. Then Khadija radiallahu anha, Khadija radiallahu anha, and then the daughter of Khadija, Fatima radiallahu anha. These are the four most special women in the history of Islam. And Ali bin Abi Talib was married to the last one of them, Fatima radiallahu anha, the princess of Islam. The princess of Islam. We call her the princess. She, are, she is our princess, radiallahu anha. She is the mother of Hassanain, Hassan and Hussein, both of them who were born to this couple, 
uh, this blessed couple, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anha and Fatima radiallahu anha. He's also one of the earliest ones to accept Islam. There are reports that he was the first one to accept Islam. In fact, uh, it is narrated by uh, Qadi Abu Ya'la in his collection that Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, he said, Bu'itha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawm al-ithnayn wa aslamtu yawm al-thulatha that the prophethood was given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on Monday. The Prophet was made a Prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday and I accepted Islam on Tuesday. I accepted Islam on Tuesday. Allahu Akbar. This is the virtue of Ali bin Abi Talib. So Ali bin Abi Talib was one of the earliest persons to accept Islam. Now, there were others who accepted Islam, for example, Khadija and Abu Bakr. So the ulama, they say the first woman to accept Islam was Khadija. The first adult man to accept Islam was Abu Bakr. And the first youngster, okay, was Ali bin Abi Talib because there are reports that his age was 10 when he accepted Islam. There are other reports that state that he was nine and there are others that say he was eight. And there are different reports on this issue. But Ali bin Abi Talib was a young person when he accepted Islam. SubhanAllah, as soon as the Messenger of Allah uh, preached Islam to his family, you know, most of the family rejected Islam. And Ali, as a youngster, he stood up, he said, I accept Islam and I will support you. SubhanAllah, he was a very, very, very dedicated Muslim for all his life. Ali bin Abi Talib, even in his childhood, never worshipped idols. This is another virtue of Ali bin Abi Talib. He never worshipped idols. Okay. And he was so important for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, among other companions, that the Messenger of Allah left Ali behind to deliver the belongings, the amanat of the people of Mecca. As we know that the Prophet sallallahu was known as a sadiq al-Amin in the city of Mecca. Even the enemies of the Prophet sallallahu they trusted him as a truthful man, as a trustworthy man. So he was known as the truthful one, as the trustworthy one. For that reason, by that virtue, people had placed their belongings with the Prophet for safekeeping. So when the Prophet had decided to migrate to Medina because his life was threatened, most of his companions had already left. So it was time for him to leave. What did he do with those belongings? Did he take them with him? No. He he left Ali bin Abi Talib behind in Mecca and he told Ali bin Abi Talib that you must return these uh, trusts that have been placed in my hands to the rightful owners. So go to these people one by one and return their belongings. And Ali bin Abi Talib was left for that particular job, which also could only be given to the most trustworthy people, which was Ali bin Abi Talib uh, radiallahu an. And uh, Ali bin Abi Talib was found in the bed of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yani he put himself in the bed so that the Qurayshis think it is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sleeping in the bed, not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had already left. So when they came to kill him inside the house, they found Ali bin Abi Talib in the bed and they did not kill him. So these are the kind of things Ali bin Abi Talib did for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just as we know that Abu Bakr had left with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this journey, on this very dangerous journey. In fact, Ali bin Abi Talib was asked once upon a time that who do you think was the bravest among the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The questioner was, was expecting again from this man who had done so much for Islam that it is me who is the bravest man among the companions, Ali bin Abi Talib. But Ali bin Abi Talib, to the surprise of the questioner, he said that it was Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Why? Because on the day of Thor, on the day of Ghar Thor, okay, when the incident of the cave of Thor took place, when the Qureshis had found the Prophet and Abu Bakr hiding in that cave, okay, uh, trying to save their lives from the Qureshis who had announced a bounty on their heads, 100 camels, 100 camels if anyone brings Muhammad وسلم, dead or alive. So everyone was looking for the Prophet. It was like a, uh, you know, like a huge bounty. So on that day, to be with the Prophet ﷺ, only the most brave, only the bravest could be with the Prophet ﷺ. So according to Ali bin Abi Talib, the bravest companion of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was Abu Bakr, who stood by the Prophet in such difficult times in the cave of Thor. Okay, 
So Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an also was one of those brave, solid, line-hearted companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi who was left behind in Mecca to do a very, very risky job, which was to return the belongings to their rightful owners, people who had placed their belongings with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also to lie in the bed of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, impersonating the Prophet, so that the Meccans think it is the Prophet resting in the bed, not uh, not Ali bin Abi Talib. Also. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, he was present in most battles, okay? Uh, he was there in Badr, subhanAllah, Ali bin Abi Talib. He was one of those people in the beginning of the battle, there was Mubariza. Mubariza was hand-to-hand, one-to-one battle, okay? When the Qureshi fighters, uh, they came forward, okay? Utba, Shayba, uh, and their likes, they came forward and they said, we challenge the fighters of the Muslim side, okay? bring our equals, bring our matches. And Hamza came forward, Ubaidah came forward, and Ali bin Abi Talib came forward. And Ali bin Abi Talib, he killed his opponent. Hamza killed his opponent, so did Ubaidah. And this raised the morale of the army at the Battle of Badr, where there were only 313 companions. So Ali, Allahu Akbar, in every single battle, almost every single battle where he was actually personally present, he was the most... uh, brave and he was on front line defending the messenger of Allah وسلم, defending the Muslim community and doing so much for Islam radiallahu an karram allahu waj alayhi salam may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessings shower his blessings upon the Prophet وسلم, and a lot of people think that we cannot say alayhi salam because some people say alayhi salam and they mean something different no we can say alayhi salam because alayhi salam simply means that may Allah's peace be upon him radiallahu an we can say that because we say assalamu alaikum to each other on every single day. Alayhi salam means may Allah's peace be upon him. And when we say to each other assalamu alaikum, it means the same thing. So Ali radiallahu an was a great personality. So he fought in the battle of Badr. He fought in the battle of Uhud. And he witnessed other battles with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the battle of Tabuk, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was leaving Ali bin Abi Talib behind and Ali was very, very upset. He was very upset. He said, Ya Rasulullah, are you going to leave me behind with women and children? Is this what I'm for? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made a very, very historic statement. He said, Oh Ali, you are like to me, uh, uh, like Harun was to Moses, but there is no prophet after me. Oh Ali, you are like that to me. You are like a brother to me, like Harun was a brother to Moses, and Moses left him behind to take care of Banu Israel. When uh, Moses, Musa salam, went to Mount Sinai to receive the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he left behind ha- Harun to take care of um, Banu Israel. Just like that, I am leaving you behind to take care of the Muslims in my absence while I am away to fight this battle uh, at the time of Ghazwa, uh, Ghazwa, At-tub- uh, Ghazwa Tabuk. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi he gave the flag on the day of Khaybar to Ali bin Abi Talib. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi announced on the day of Khaybar, or when the battle of Khaybar was taking place, Khaybar was not being conquered. It was very difficult to conquer it. It was almost impregnable, the fortress of Khaybar, where the, some of the hostile Jewish tribes were taking uh, refuge. Not all the Jewish tribes were hostile to Muslims. There were those that, uh, that had treaty with the Muslims and they were in peace. But there were some who were fighting against the Muslims who were sabotaging uh, you know, every single opportunity uh, the Muslims had to, for their safety and they were trying to put Muslim lives in danger. So Khaybar was attacked and this was a very, very severe, difficult ba- battle. So when the, when the fortress of Khaybar was uh, uh, difficult to conquer, Rasulullah said, in the morning, I will give the flag, the alam, okay, uh, to a man who is beloved to Allah and his messenger. Who is beloved to Allah and his messenger and vice versa. Allahu Akbar. That night, most of the companions of the messenger of Allah, وسلم, they were wishing that they received the flag in the morning. They were wishing. Even Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu an, he said that I was praying that night. I was hoping that I would be that person. Okay. And then in the morning, Rasulullah asked for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Aina Ali. 
where is Ali? And he was told that Ali, he is going through some pain. His eyes are hurting. So the Prophet Sallallahu asked him to come and Ali came and the Prophet Sallallahu he applied his uh, blessed spit on the eyes of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh, and his, his eyes were immediately healed and Allah put so much blessing in him that he became the cause of the conquest of Khaybar. Ali radiallahu an he held the door of Khaybar, the fortress, single-handedly for the Muslims to enter and conquer. And there are reports, for example, Ibn Asakir, he reports that that door, only 14 men could lift that door, how heavy that door was. This is how heavy that door was. 40 people could lift it together. Allahu Akbar. Ali bin Abi Talib did it alone. Radiallahu an. So that was a huge virtue on the part of Ali bin Abi Talib. Also in the battle of Ahzab in the year 5 Hijri when the Qurayshis had accumulated, had mustered a giant army to come and attack the Muslims in Medina. And uh, in that battle, Muslims had dug a ditch around Medina. The Prophet had ordered the digging of a long ditch around Medina to protect Medina from an outside attack. Almost 10,000 people had besieged Medina. According to other reports, 24,000. This is why this battle was called the, the Battle of Ahzab. Ghazwatul Ahzab, the Battle of Armies, right? And in this battle, one of the Qurayshis, who was known as a very famous Arabian fighter in Arabia, throughout the Arabian Peninsula, he was known for his skills in fighting, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. His name was Ibn al-Wud. He had crossed the ditch. He came to the side of the Muslims and he taunted all the Muslims. Is there anyone who is going to fight me? Ali was a very young man at the time. Ali was, radiallahu an, possibly in his early 20s, very young or maybe late Teens. Okay. Ali bin Abi Talib stood up, radiallahu an, and he said, I will fight you. Because other Muslims, they knew this man's profile, they knew his skills, they knew his ability. So they did not accept the challenge because they knew they will be killed against such a fighter. So Ali bin Abi Talib, to defend the honor of the Muslims, he stood up. Now, this does not mean that other companions were a bunch of cowards, they were a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, whatever, kaza wa kaza, people say all sorts of things. Uh, and only most unfortunate people think like this about the companions. They were humans. They had human sentiments. They had human feelings, right? There were times when they were in fear. There were times when they didn't care about their lives and they fell in the feet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sacrificing their lives like what happened in the Battle of Uhud. And, and the list goes on. The sacrifices of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu are countless. Anyone who looks at their lives holistically, you will see as to how many sacrifices they so different times, different companions did different virtuous things. And in this case, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the man who saved the day. Allahu Akbar. Radiallahu an. So he accepted the challenge. So he stood up three times and all three times the Prophet told him to sit down because the Prophet knew Ali is a young man. He is inexperienced. He is not going to be able to fight this experienced fighter called Ibn al-Wud. But when Ali insisted because other companions were not uh, accepting the challenge, Rasulullah sallallahu allowed Ali to take on the challenge. And Ali went and finished the job to the shock of the entire community. And that drove so much passion through the Muslims. Allahu Akbar, every Muslim woke up. You know, Ali was the cause of this awakening. You know, Muslims were feeling very down. They were besieged. Almost 300 Muslims uh, besieged by an army of 10,000. They were in a state of fear and shock. You can imagine you can only imagine the condition of the Muslims. Even the Prophet وسلم, on the day of the battle could not pray Salah. He had to join all his prayers at the end of the prayer, uh, at the end of the day. And he prayed against the Qurayshis for making him miss all his prayers because the situation was so dire and severe. Okay? And some of the Muslims, they had to play Salat al -Khuf. They had to pray Salat al -Khuf. So Ali bin Abi Talib, having uh, dealt with Ibn al-Wud, he drove you know, courage through the Muslim ranks, Allahu Akbar. And he was also, subhanAllah, that person who uh, has this virtue on his scale, radiallahu anh. He was also given the title Aba Turab. Aba Turab. Why? Because once Ali bin Abi Talib, it is reported in our sources, 
that Ali, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, he had uh, an argument with Fatima radiallahu anha. And you can imagine from this that even the best of the best, you know, there were times when they disagreed with each other. The best of the best, the best human to walk the planet, you know, they were humans. After all, they were humans, right? They had human feelings. So there were times when they, you know, uh, argued with each other. There were times when they disagreed with each other. So Ali bin Abi Talib had a disagreement with the Fa Fatima radiallahu anha with his wife. So he went to the masjid in a state of, uh, in a state of um, uh, anger. He lied basically uh, on the floor. And when he was lying on the floor, uh, there was dust all over him because uh, the masajid or the masjid of Medina, masjid al-Nabawi, was not like our masajid. You know, our masajid have carpets, mashallah, fans, air conditioning and nice designs and lavish mosques like palaces, which is okay, alhamdulillah, as long as we keep the simplicity of Islam, okay? But the, the mosque of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a, an epitome of simplicity, Allahu Akbar. So Ali bin Abi Talib was lying on the floor in the masjid, masjid al Nabawi, and there was dust all over him. The Prophet came looking for him. He went to the house, and Fatima radiallahu anha told him that he got upset and he left and he went. So the Prophet came looking for him in the masjid, and he found him in the masjid, uh, dust all over him. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Qum ya Aba Turab, Qum ya Aba Turab, rise, O oh, the father of the dust. Rise, O oh, father of the dust, Allahu Akbar. This title was so beloved to Ali bin Abi Talib that he would love to hear this from the mouth of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu but he did not like it when others used it for him. He only liked it from the mouth of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Such was his love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ali bin Abi Talib narrated over 500 reports from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, Ali bin Abi Talib narrated over 500 reports from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To be precise, according to Imam Sayyuti, 586 reports. Okay, the books of Ahlul Sunnah have more reports from Ali bin Abi Talib and his sons than, the books, than in the books of others who claim to love Ali bin Abi Talib and his sons. I repeat, the books of Ahlul Sunnah even in the Siha Sitta, the six authentic collections of the Sunnis, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, we have more reports from Ali bin Abi Talib than they are uh, to be found in the books of those who claim to love Ali bin Abi Talib, who claim to love Abi, Ali bin Abi Talib. We have more reports from Ali bin Abi Talib in Siha Sitta than we have from, uh, for example, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. Allahu Akbar. We have reports from Hassan and Hussein. We also have reports from Imam Zainul Abidin radiallahu an and his sons Ja'far, Imam Ja'far and Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. Allahu Akbar. Such is our love for the Ahl al-Bayt, the children of Ali bin Abi Talib and his family. So, who reported from Ali bin Abi Talib when Ali was reporting from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa For example, what reports are we talking about? There is a report in Sahih Muslim, for example, whereby Ali bin Abi Talib stated that on the day of Khaybar, on the day of Khaybar, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, forbade two things. He forbade two things. Okay, in particular, in particular, the meat of domestic donkeys, it is haram for Muslims. The meat of domestic donkeys and muta'a, muta'a, muta which is temporary marriage, it is haram in Islam. It was allowed in pre-Islamic era. It was allowed for some time within Islam because Islam was revealed over 23 years. The Quran was revealed over 23 years. In the early days of Islam, drinking khamar, drinking wine was not made haram. Other things were not directly made haram, but slowly, gradually, with the revelation of the Quran throughout 23 years, some of the things were made haram conclusively later on, such as khamar, for example. Okay, khamar was made haram gradually. First verse about Khamar in the Quran uh, came that they are asking you about intoxicants. Tell them there may be benefit in there, but the loss outweighs the benefit. The harm outweighs the benefit. Some people claim there is benefit. There may be benefit, but the harm outweighs 
the benefit by far. Then another verse came to make it even more disliked. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, uh, la taqrabu salah wa antum sukara. Oh, who you believe, do not go close to pray when you are in a state of drunkenness, when you are drunk with intoxicants. Then the final verse, the final blow to khamar, to wine, to alcohol, to uh, you know any forms of intoxicant, whether you're smoking or drinking or however you are uh, taking, whether you're taking injections, every single intoxicant in Islam is haram. Every single intoxicant, every single substance that makes you intoxicated is haram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it haram in Surah Al-Ma'idah when Allah revealed the following verse. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Innam al khamru wal maysru wal ansabu wal azlamu rejisum min amal shaitani fajtanibuhu la allakum tuflihun. Oh, you believe uh, wine or intoxicants, rather, intoxicants, gambling, throwing arrows for luck. These are the actions of shaitan. These are the actions of shaitan. Fajtanibuhu. You abstain from all of them. Abstain. Stay away. Do not touch. Do not go near. La'allahum tuflihun. So that you may prosper. Likewise, muta'a, according to the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, was made haram uh, at the time of Khaybar. Then it was allowed temporarily again, and then it was made haram completely, conclusively at Hajjatul Wada'a. Hajjatul Wada'a, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, delivered his final sermon to the most of his companions, and he said, Muta'a is haram until the Day of Judgment. It is haram until Yawm al Qiyamah. Okay, and this report it can be found in Sunnan of Abi Dawood. Sunnan of Abi Dawood, Rahmatullahi alayhi. So Ali bin Abi Talib was one of those people who reported the hurma of or tahrim of Buta. So who was reporting from Ali bin Abi Talib? Who transmitted his knowledge to the future generations? His son Hassan, his son Hussein, his son Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, who was not born of Fatima, but rather another woman from the tribe of Banu Hanifa. Muhammad, his name was Muhammad. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. عن, and Ibn Masood, Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Zubair. Ibn Zubair was the son of Abdu, uh, Zubair bin Awam. Abu Musa al Ashari, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, was Zaid bin Arkham, was Jabir bin Abdullah, was Abu Umama, was Abu Huraira. And Khalaik min al Sahaba wa Tabi'in, Radwan Allahu alayhim ajma'in. Many people from the Sahaba. And Tabi'in narrated from Ali bin Abi Talib. Many Tabi'in, they took knowledge from Ali bin Abi Talib uh, directly. And some of them are like Ibn Sarin, for example, or Hassan Basri. These people also, they took knowledge from Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So, Fadail of Ali bin Abi Talib are absolutely countless. Wallahi, I can go on and on where, uh, you know, subhanAllah, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu for example, when he said to uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was leaving him behind, uh, this is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, wa akhraj al-shaykhan an Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, khalafa Ali bin Abi Talib fi Ghazwa Tabuk, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa left behind Ali bin Abi Talib in Ghazwa Tabuk, and faqala ya Rasulullah, takhal, uh, are you leaving me behind with women and children? Are you not happy, O oh Ali, that you are like to me the way Harun was to Musa? Subhanallah, apart from the fact that there is no prophet after me. So the Messenger of Allah told this to Ali bin Abi Talib to please him that I am not just leaving you behind you because you are not important. I'm leaving you behind because you are very important. Like Harun was to Musa, Allahu Akbar. So do not think that I'm leaving you behind for that. Okay. Also, there are so many other um, reports in favor of Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu an. Okay. When the verse was revealed, Imam Muslim narrates, Akhraja Muslim an Saad ibn Abu Baqas, radiallahu an, kama, uh, قال, 
This verse is Ali Imran, verse number 61, the ayah of Mubahala. The ayah of Mubahala when the Prophet ﷺ challenged the Christians of Najran. Okay, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, challenged them to Mubahala. Mubahala is that we get together and we invoke the curse of Allah upon the liars. That the Christians, if they are, on a, they are upon truth, then they will be fine. If the Muslims are upon the truth, then they will be fine. But they did not accept the challenge. The Christians of Najran did not accept the challenge because they thought, what if, the, the, what if Muhammad is indeed a true prophet of Allah, then we will be destroyed. So they did not take the risk. And the prophet was indeed uh, a messenger of Allah. So the Prophet at this point, when the verse says, bring your sons and your, um, bring your sons and we will bring our sons. Okay. Uh, and the Prophet at that time, the Rasulullah Aliyan. For Fatima, for Hassanan, for Hussainan, for Kala Allahumma, Ha Ulai, Ahli, O oh Allah, this is my Ahl, this is my Ahl, this is my family, Allahu Akbar. Now, a lot of people claim from this report that the Prophet was saying that this is the only family I have. Okay. Okay. The Prophet did not say, Innama Ahli, or Innama Ha Ulai, Ahli. He did not say, this is only my family. Allah, this is my family only. No, the Prophet did not say. He said, this is my family. This is my family, which means, oh Allah, this is my family. In other words, the, the family of Ali bin Abi Talib, Ali bin Abi Talib, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, these were the people of the family of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who else is the family of the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? His wives. Because there is another report where Umm Salama, one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu she asked him, Ya Rasulullah, are we not your family? Or am I not your family? The Prophet said, you have your place. You are also my family. In other words, you have your place. So in other words, the Prophet Sallallahu was saying that my wives are my family and these people are my family. In this report, the Prophet never said, this is only my family or only these people are my family. Audhu Billah, the Prophet never claimed that just like some other people claim based upon this report. So this means Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein are also the family, of course, according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And we love them wholeheartedly. We love the family of the Prophet ﷺ, whether it is Ali ibn Abi Talib, his children, his wife, the Prophet's uncle Abbas and his children and the Prophet's wives. Because Allah says in the Quran that the wives are the family of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Ahzab, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, An-Nabiyu Awla Bil-Mu'mineen, Wa Azwajuhu Ummahatuhum. The Prophet takes precedence over the believers. He is more important than the believers. And his wives are their mothers. His wives are their mothers. So here Allah is saying, the Prophet is topmost in honor, in devotion, in respect and then his wives, Allahu Akbar. This is the point Allah is making in this verse. This is the point Allah is making this verse. So in honor, in devotion, in respect, the Prophet is topmost, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then are his wives, because Allah is saying, why is Allah saying, Azwajuhu Ummahatuhum, Wa Azwajuhu Ummahatuhum. Why is Allah mentioning this? What's the point? The point is, Allah is saying, those people who do not respect his wives, whoever they may be, those who do not respect his wives, cannot possibly respect the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you don't respect my wife you don't respect me period and i am an ordinary man if you know me as a brother in islam and you don't respect my wife you do not respect me if you do not have marwa if you don't have courtesy for my wife then you do not have courtesy for me this is how simple it is i may be arguing with my wife on day, on daily basis I may be having arguments, I may be having disagreements, I may not see eye to eye with my wife, but that does not mean people can disrespect me. And that wasn't even the case with the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet loved his wives, he respected them, he honored them to an extent that he would visit them every single day. The first thing he would do after the morning Athkar and his, uh, his ibadat, he would go to every single wife's house and ask them if they need anything. This is how the Prophet ﷺ honored his wives. So those of you who do not respect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wives, don't think you respect the Prophet.
stop thinking you respect the Prophet or stop thinking you even respect Ali bin Abi Talib because these wives are the mothers of Ali. If you do not respect the mother of Ali bin Abi Talib, you can never respect Ali bin Abi Talib, period. The Quran says that the wives of the Prophet, Aisha in particular, and others are the mothers of Ali bin Abi Talib. That's the status the Quran gives to the wives of the Prophet Okay. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states about the Ahlul Bayt, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that Allah wishes to remove rids, impurity from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. That means wives as well as Ali bin Abi Talib and his family and the uncles of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. Also moving on, one of the most powerful statements the Messenger of Allah wasallam made about Ali bin Abi Talib, which is also very much twisted by people who claim to love the Messenger of Allah and Ali bin Abi Talib, is Man kuntu maulah fa'aliyun maulah. Okay? Man kuntu maulah fa'aliyun maulah. Allahumma wali man walah wa'adi man a'adah. Okay? This report is narrated by many, many, many companions. For example, akhrajahu Ahmad an Ali wa Abi Ayyub al-Ansari wa Zaid bin Arqam wa Amr uh, okay wa Abu Abu Ya'la an Abi Huraira wa Tibrani an Ibn Umar wa Malik bin Al-Hawairith okay uh, wa Habashi bin Janada wa Jarir wa Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas wa Abi Sayyid al-Khudri wa Anas wa, uh, and Bazar narrates from Ibn Abbas okay there are so many reports so many different variant reports on this very issue the Prophet Sallallahu at a place called Ghadir Khum. Ghadir Khum. Ghadir Khum, he made the statement and he stood with Ali and he said, whoever is Ali's Mawla, then I am his Mawla. Or whoever has Ali, or whoever has me as his Mawla, as his friend, as his ally, okay, then I am his, uh, sorry, then Ali is also his friend, his ally. Why? Why did the Prophet make this statement? What's the context? Because there were some companions who were in Yemen with Ali bin Abi Talib. They came complaining to the Prophet وسلم, about some, some things Ali bin Abi Talib, some decisions Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh, had made in Yemen. Some of the decisions they did not like and they criticized Ali bin Abi Talib in front of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the Messenger of Allah, his face became red because of his love for Ali bin Abi Talib. Because of his love. His face became red. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And the Prophet Sallallahu he went to this public spot in Ghadir Khum. And he stood with Ali bin Abi Talib. And he said, am I not your ally? Am I not your friend? And the word Mawla here is taken in the meaning of Wali. Or Wali. The root word for Mawla and Wali is the same word Wala. Okay, wala, which means to ally, which means to be friend, which means to become close, related. Okay, this is what it means. Because some people take a different kind of meaning from this. They say, no, this means a successor, a political successor. The Prophet here was appointing Ali bin Abi Talib as a successor. If the companions understood this statement to mean that, they would never have appointed another in that place. Never would they have done this. No one even discussed it that way, the way some people erroneously discuss it later on and the meaning they take from it. They would never appoint another in the place of Ali if this is the meaning they understood from this statement when the Prophet made this statement and in the context. How do I know this? Because these very people, they fought over minor things in the Sunnah. One, give you one example. In the time of Uthman, Uthman radiallahu an, when he was the Khalifa, when he was the ruler, when he went for Hajj in Mina, he decided to pray, pray four rakat. He decided to pray four rakat, and Ibn Masood, radiallahu an, he came and he argued with him. He said, "How can you pray four when the Messenger of Allah prayed two here? So, on what authority, Uthman, are you praying four? The Messenger of Allah, who is better than all of us, he prayed two here. So, Uthman insisted that." The Messenger of Allah وسلم, considered himself to be a traveler. That's why he prayed too. I have a wife in Makkah. I have a wife in Makkah. So I am 
uh, I am someone who considers himself someone who lives in Mecca. So he prayed for, and Ibn Masood, having argued with him, joined him because he was the leader. The point I'm making is they argued about things like this. So can you imagine the Prophet appointing someone as his successor, clearly, and the companions not arguing about it? No, 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 no. We cannot assume such evil things on part of the companions because they did not understand the statement in this context because the context was that some people came complaining about Ali bin Abi Talib and the Prophet to confirm his status in Islam, he stood up and he said, Man kuntu mawla, who would have me as his ally, as his friend, as his close um, associate related in the bond of Islam, like Allah says in the Quran, innama waliyukum Allahu wa rasooluhu walladheena amanu alladheena yuqeemuna salata wa yutuna zakat your wali your ally, your friend, your protector is Ali, sorry, Allah, then his messenger and the believers, then the believers, which believers? Those who pray and they give zakat. So this is the term wali in this context means man kuntu mawla fa'aliyu mawla fa'aliyun mawla who would have me as his protector, as his friend, as his ally, then Ali is also is his ally and his friend. And the next statement clarifies the matter once and for all. It basically seals the matter. What is the next statement? Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man aada. Oh Allah, you befriend the one who befriends, befriends him and you become the enemy of the one who becomes his enemy. Allahu Akbar. All the companions were shaken by this statement and they could never imagine holding any grudges or any feelings of dislikeness towards Ali bin Abi Talib after that day. Allahu Akbar. Even, the, even though some of the companions they disagreed massively with Ali bin Abi Talib, they could not hold grudges against him because of this statement. Even Muawiyah radiallahu an, when he fought against Ali bin Abi Talib in the Battle of Siftin, he could not hold. In fact, there are reports from Muawiyah who said, I am never claiming, I never claimed that Ali is uh, uh, inferior to me. Rather, I am claiming that Ali is superior to me in all virtues, in all forms. I never claimed that I am superior to Ali bin Abi Talib. Ali is superior to me. Muawiyah made it very clear. But his conflict with Ali was about the issue of the murderers of Uthman. The murderers of Uthman, radiallahu an. This, was, this is another very big topic which I cannot cover in a short period like this. So the statement, Allahumma wali man wala, which is part of the hadith, by the way, wa'ali man ada clarifies that here the Prophet ﷺ is talking about befriending, allying, be friendly towards, okay, having a feeling of love and compassion towards this person. That's why the Prophet said, whoever has love for me, compassion for me, a feeling of alliance, a friendship towards me, then he would be the same with Ali. Man kuntu mawla, fa'aliyun mawla. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So there are so many other reports. For example, Imam At-Tirmizi narrates, and also Nisai, uh, Imam Al-Nasai Ibn Majah narrate from uh, Habashi uh, bin Junada, who said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu Ali yu minni wa ana min Ali. That Ali is from me and I am from Ali. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Okay. And the Prophet also said, this is not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Imam Muslim narrates from Ali bin Abi Talib that he said that anyone in the time of the Prophet ﷺ who had bughd, bughd towards me or hatred towards me, you know, only a believer would love me and only a munafiq, a hypocrite would hate me. So to hate Ali bin Abi Talib, but I repeat, to hate Ali bin Abi Talib is nifaq, it is, a, it is hypocrisy. The one who hates Ali bin Abi Talib is a munafiq, is a munafiq. I am clearly stating this. Anyone who hates Ali bin Abi Talib is a munafiq. And anyone who loves him is a mu'min. Just like the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, there's a hadith from the Prophet. The Prophet said, Hubbul Ansar Ayatul Iman wa Hubbul uh, wa, wa Bughdul Ansar Ayatul Nifaq. Okay, 
the love of Ansar, who were the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is a sign of Iman and the hatred of Ansar is a sign of hypocrisy, nifaq. Such a person is a munafiq who hates Ansar or who hates Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. Okay, there are other reports about Ali bin Abi Talib. I simply do not have time to go through them. Now, this is the time to recommend sources, right? Okay, this is one of the most important sources I strongly recommend. Okay, this is called Tariq al-Khulafa. Tariq al-Khulafa by Imam al-Sayyuti. Imam al-Sayyuti, he has written this book, Tariq al-Khulafa. It has the biographies of the, the caliphs who followed on from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khulafa al-Rashidin and onwards, and all the history of the rulers in the Khulafa up to the time of <coughs> Imam al-Sayyuti. Imam al-Sayyuti. Very, very important book. You have to get Tariq al-Khulafa of Imam Sayyuti. Also, if you want to read more details on Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh, then there's a very, very powerful book I strongly recommend. It is by Allahu Akbar, uh, Sheikh Ali al-Sallabi. Doctor Sheikh Ali al-Sallabi, he has written this very powerful, detailed biography of Ali bin Abi Talib. It is in Arabic, it is in English, and you can find it in the Urdu language as well. Ali al-Sallabi, he has done this biography of Ali bin Abi Talib, which is detailed, very, very extensive, with a lot of details on the life of Ali bin Abi Talib. And he discusses his conflict with some of the companions and uh, uh, you know the Battle of Jamal, the Battle of Sifin. Ali bin Abi Talib came to power as the Khalifa as a result of the murder of Uthman bin Affan, who was killed in 